Hi guys, welcome back to the Forgetful Scholar. Let's chat about books, two books. So this week is Shoes, and I swear I won't tell anybody, and then immediately tells Best Friend. So uh, let's start with FM Historical, and this is Chasing Cassandra by Lisa Claypez, and this is The Revenal Book 6, I believe. Yeah, Book 6. And then look at that beautiful step back. Now this one is shoes, because when I picked it up, I noticed she's not wearing shoes under her dress. So I thought maybe this was like a Cinderella kind of retelling. No, <laughs> it's not a Cinderella kind of retelling. Not really. But so this is the twin sister to Pandora, which we read her story earlier. And I gave this a five. Um, the Revenal family series overall, I would give it like a four. I There are a lot of books in there that I enjoy, none of them that I like couldn't stand. So I, I enjoyed myself. Um, I liked it better than The Wallflowers, but I like The Hathaways more. So it's sort of in between for me. Now, this starts off with Cassandra, of course, you know. Um, now, I knew, like, who didn't know that Tom Servan... Um, Devin and Wes, her cousins, who take over the estate and take care of her sisters and herself. Um, friend Tom was going to be, we all knew Tom was going to be the love interest, right? Like that was pretty obviously foreshadowed and pushed forward, right? Okay, okay. Because like Wes, I'm uh, not Wes, Reese married Helen, which is Cassandra's older sister. So we knew that. Now, I will say there is, I'm going to, this came out 2020, and I will say there's, this is just going to be full of spoilers. Um, and this is more, one of the more recent books, you know, that just came out 2020. So don't want spoilers. See you later. Hope to see you for the next video. Anyway, um, and there is a, I want, do want to give you a warning. Like, I would say in the middle of the book, nearly smack dab in the middle of the book, towards the final um third act right a little towards the third act a little before you know um she's not really courting but there's this guy who's not tom who's interested in her and when they're in the museum he kind of pushes her into a dark room by herself and gropes her and it's a horrible scene i'm just giving you guys a warning because i like warnings <laughs> i like trigger warnings so i'm giving you guys a warning it is a horrible scene uh, Cassandra comes out okay. Um, it's written horribly, which it should be. Not horribly. It's not written horribly, like as if as if like the narration was bad. No, the narration was so good that you can't feel help but feel terrible for Cassandra. That's what I meant. Like it invokes horrible. You feel gross when you read it, as it should, right? Because this is a horrible moment. Um, but she gets through it okay. Okay, so I just wanted to give that kind of warning before I go forward. So, Tom, like Cassandra, like we start at Pandora's wedding. And Cassandra's happy for a twin, but feeling a little sad for herself. Because out of the sisters, out of her twin sister, especially she's the one that like wanted to find love, but hasn't yet. And there's a line there, isn't that always the way, the one that's looking for love never finds it, but the one that wants nothing to do with it, it falls in their lap. And I was like, oof, that's a good line. So she's kind of like, Wes, I'm never gonna find a man that I love to marry. Um, if I don't find one in a couple of years, will you be my oyster or will you be my backup plan? And Wes is like, no. Probably because Wes and Devin, and my dog's scratching again. <laughs> Probably because Wes and Devin think of the Revenal girls as sisters. As like sister slash daughter kind of thing. So like, of course Wes is like, no. But in that room, Tom is there. And Tom's like, I'll do it. Because he immediately falls in infatuation with her. Um... And I do like that Cassandra said that she's just always thought of as Pandora's twin sister, the one that's not Pandora, because even in the stories of the story of Kathleen, which is their sister-in-law, the story of Helen, their older half-sister, the story of Pandora as well, Cassandra kind of faded into the background. Not that she's a shy person, but because the twins are always together and Pandora is such a robust 
fills up the room kind of personality, Cassandra tends to be forgotten about, um, by the reader at least, at least by me. So when she said that, I was like, yeah, she's kind of forgettable. So I really liked this book because you really get to know Cassandra and she's a sweet person and you've seen shades of that. Both her and Pandora didn't think twice about helping Helen, their older sister, adopt and take care of Helen's half-sister that looks like could be her daughter. They were both like completely supportive and my hair, I can't get over how bad my hair is today. For like one of the rare days in the desert, it's humid. So we're just gonna ignore all this nonsense, okay? Okay. Um, so like without thinking, they jump in to help, you know? So it's, you know that Cassandra's nice. And I like that in this book, there's more to her than a pretty face. She's an avid reader. And I do like, I have been finding myself really enjoying books where the main characters bond over reading, whether it's like, what was that Julia Quinn book where the two main characters were reading a horrible romance novel where the the mother was pecked together, te pecked to death by pigeons and they were bonding all over how much they hated that book. So like that was cute. And this is cute too, because she's an avid reader. And Tom, whose personality very much makes me think of Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, you know? So very much that type of personality. Um, is he on the spectrum of, you know, something? Probably, but you know, there we go. Um, he's a very fascinating character. I like when, I really liked him because I like when the main leads are different. And this is a very different kind of character as well. Um, and I am a sucker for like the guy, whether he's a tough warrior or he's so intelligent, he kind of pushes his emotions aside, but whatever, the guy like doesn't feel emotions. And then slowly, because he loves this woman, he starts feeling all the mushy and gooey love. And I'm like, oh, I love that trope. I love that trope. I eat it with a spoon. I love it. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> um, so that, you know, Tom's like, I have five emotions and that's enough. I can't, well, I was going like this for five. I have five emotions and that's enough. I don't have time for anything else. I got shit to do. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, he doesn't really read fantasy, like fiction. He reads history, things like that. She convinces him to read um, Jules Verne and Tom Sawyer and things like that. You know what I mean? And open up his world. She convinces him to read Jane, uh, Jane Austen, which he hated, which, okay. You know, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> um, so, like, it was fascinating, like, him reading these books to try to understand her. And I thought that was very sweet because I love it when the big, tough, I don't have emotion guys show that they do have emotion, you know, in books. In real life, that drives me nuts. In books. Um, it was so, oh, I love, ah, I loved it. Ate it with a spoon. Okay. And then what I really liked about this book, there is this orphan boy named Basil that um basically Tom adopts like he sees himself in him he tries to better his situation and through that and Cassandra sees different sides of him than his friends see you know what I mean and because of that she falls for him um and through taking care of Basil which isn't an easy road it's a rough road not from Basil's point of view Basil's a sweetheart um but Tom letting not only Cassandra in, but Basil in, you see why he shut himself off to emotions. You know what I mean? And like, it's, I'm like, okay, I can understand that. You know, a hundred percent. Like, I feel like the causation equals, um, his reaction to it. You know what I mean? Cause sometimes I've read books where that reaction isn't quite equal for me. You know what I mean? So I, I like that. Now back to the, piece of shit, uh, that did, um, unwanted touch. So basically he's like, I'll marry you, Cassandra. I'll be your oyster. And she's like, I don't even know who you are. Who are you? And <laughs> Wes and Devin are against it because they know Tom, um, uh, likes the chase and then gets bored and every love affair he's had, he's broken the girl's heart, not intentionally, but just because, you know, um, and even himself thinks his heart is frozen that he can't love. So they don't want that for their dear sweet cousin slash sister Cassandra and I call their slash sister they're not biologically sisters but they treat them like that anyway um 
But through this, Cassandra and Tom get to know each other, which I love. I don't love love. I don't enjoy love at first sight, but I love when characters get to know each other. See, like, I don't mind, like, them being like, oh, I love at first sight. And then some, for some reason in the story, everyone has to calm down and ha they have to get to know the person. Like, it's not just a pretty face on either side. You know what I mean? So I accept love at first sight, but hold on. There's a stopgap. Now you get to know the, the person behind the face and you, you love them even more. That I'm fine with. And that's what this book did. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so the shoes thing. So at a dinner party and already, you know, they're sort of getting to know each other. Um, a couple of miscommunications on the way. You know, right away he she kind of um, pushes his I don't feel anything boundaries and he freaks out and backs up, which always happens um in books that I feel in real life right so they're at a dinner party and she's wearing these beautiful gorgeous shoes that she fell in love with but are killing her feet which come on who hasn't been there who hasn't been there with the cutest pair of shoes that is like killing your feet but like you're like oh but they're so pretty and I and they cost so much right right who hasn't been there so during the dinner party, she takes off her shoes just because her feet are, she can't feel her toes, you know? So she takes off her shoes and then they go to, you know, where the men go to have brandy and the women go to have tea and she's trying to find her other shoe and she can't find it. So she's pretending that she still has the heel on and hoping her dress covers it. And then Tom, because he's a super genius and he has a uh, eidetic memory, he remembers everything, he knows something and he's fixated with Cassandra even though he doesn't want to admit it he knows something's wrong so he's like what's wrong and she's like I, I I don't know where my other shoe is and she expected him to mock her he didn't he's like go wait in the conservatory for me I'll go find it and he does and he makes sure no one knows that he has her shoe because it would be horrible the gossip and all that right so he goes to the conservatory and then it's like sort of the Cinderella moment where they dance and she dances barefoot and they dance in the conservatory. And it's such a beautiful scene. Like, and it was so well written. I could picture it so clearly in my head. And I was like, oh, this would be such a beautiful scene. You know, like the moonlight coming in, her beautiful dress, barefoot. Um, but trying to like on her tippy toes and him in a suit. And they're just dancing among all these beautiful plants and stuff. Like, I, I don't know. I really like that scene. Anyway. So, you know, at this point, she doesn't think he's serious about her. He kind of backs off a little bit because he's a little too serious for his own comfort. So they both kind of semi-court other people. And this one guy who's courting um, Cassandra, he does the, the stranger bad touch. And then her family, you know, she gets out of there and she tells her family in the carriage because she was pretty sure that Devin would kill the guy and she doesn't want the gossip because remember at this time gossip can destroy your life you know and this author makes a point of that because what this asshole does so the asshole I don't even remember his name and I don't want to remember his name so <laughs> there we go he tells everybody that like they you know had sex and then she he you know proposed to make an honest woman of her and she's like no I don't want you so he spreads that and ruins Cassandra's reputation and by now we've seen Cassandra as the sweet fun loving avid reader who worries about everybody who's desperate to find love like the rest of her family and is slowly trying to reconcile herself as just having a normal ton marriage instead of like all her family who have found love. You know what I mean? So we're suffering with her, right? We're trying to go on that journey with her. Really great writing. And again, Lisa Claypez does an amazing job with family dynamics, good and bad. And this is just a testament to it because I really enjoyed the sibling dynamics, all of it. And I do appreciate her pulling back. Like you could tell who's her favorite in these stories and it's not Cassandra. And I appreciate pulling back because in the past, this author has gone full tilt into her favorites despite this not being their story you know what I mean so I appreciate that that's why I think this is a five for me because other books like this she's diverted the POV and she's done her favorites for chapter after chapter when they don't need to be there so I appreciate that now um so she's basically ruined with the gossip and then 
because before this horrible moment happened, she met this asshole's father who's also looking for a bride. And he's like, oh, too bad you're, my son found you first because I would happily have courted you. And he's like staring at her like she gets creeped out. You know, you kind of get the feeling that he's just looking at her as like a pretty little trinket to put on his wall, you know. So like he's creepy, the son's horrible. And then someone sends an anonymous letter on the to be printed in the newspaper so everyone reads about Lady C and everybody knows who it is. So she's ruined, you know, she's ruined. And no one really knows what to do. Um, Lady Beerwick, who was in Kathleen's story, you know, the proper woman that's trying to teach the Revenal sisters proper lady, lady etiquette. She's, I didn't like her in this. She wasn't in it a lot, but she's kind of stuck in like, well, you have to do it. Like very stuck in the old fashioned what this is happening. You have to remember this is like the beginning of the industrial age. So um, where you have independently industrial people like Reese Witherspoon, Winterborn, and Thomas Servin, who are poor working class that are now million, like their their time. If they're in this period, they're probably billionaires. You know, changing the world around them, and like the the prestige. You know, the lords and ladies are like, oh, upstart! How dare they when their fortunes are dwindling. You know what I mean? So it's a very interesting time. So Lady Beerick definitely represents like the old guard, what's happening. Um, so it's very fascinating, especially since Cassandra isn't like Pandora and doesn't like outward rebel. She tries to do the right thing, but the right thing isn't working out for her because people like the asshole that, you know, touched her unwantedly and then ruined her reputation because she told him, I never want to see your face again because good for you, girl. You know what I mean? And um, they can't figure out who does. Like, the whole family rallies around him because they're wonderful. And they try to figure out who put the letter, who's doing this, how to fix this. And Tom comes in. And, like, I'm not going to tell you who wrote the letter because it's a fun moment. Tom comes in, saves the day, finds out who um, wrote the letter because he bought the paper. In, like, one day, this was happening. He bought the paper. He did it for her. And she's kind of, like, stunned. And I think that is one of the moment she starts to realize that Tom actually does feel for her. He just doesn't know it. Or at least that's how it felt like the reader. Like you see that Tom loves her. He just doesn't recognize it. You know, he doesn't realize it. And you know, then they have a contract negotiation for their future relationship, which is completely the Big Bang Theory, which I thought was fun. Um, but that's not the end of it. There's twists and turns. And then, th and then Lisa Cleopas, our third act queen comes in right when literally pages from the end, a kidnapping. <laughs> like, I'm like, what? I mean, it gets resolved really quick and it's a really touching scene um, right after. And then the next scene after that is kind of funny. But like, I was like, what the? There's two pages left. What the hell? So I had a fun time with this. Five stars. I spoiled a lot, but I didn't tell everything. There's some twists and turns in there. So I enjoyed it quite a bit. So the next one, I was a little... I want something else uh, than romance. So I tried the Death by Dumplings, Noodle Shop Mysteries, book one by Vivian Chan. Chen? Chen. Like, I love, I love, 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 love the book covers for these stories. This, I enjoyed a lot. I liked Lana's personality. I I thought the writing voice was very strong. I enjoyed the mystery. There are a few twists and turns, like few smaller mysteries all along the way. Um, it was, I like knew right away what was going on with Peter and Mr. Fong. Mr. Fong is the dead guy. Knew right away what that was. You know what I mean? I was like, okay. But that's not the biggest mystery. And the biggest mystery, I was like, it's probably this guy, but let's see. And it was, it was. And I don't want to, because it's a mystery book. I don't want to spoil who did it. But um, reading it, finding out who the bad guy is, and then thinking back on all the clues given during the story, I was like, yeah, this was well-placed. This was a well-placed mystery. Um, the solution didn't come out of thin air. There were clues leading up to this that the reader could follow. Um, so I, so four stars. I really liked the mystery. I liked her. 
I liked her friendship with her roommate, the dynamic between the two. I like the relationship she has with her family because family isn't always fun times and sassiness. Sometimes they annoy the shit out of you <laughs> and you love them anyway, you know, and sometimes you annoy the shit out of them and they love you anyway, you know. So it was a very different family dynamic and everyone just trying to push her to find a boyfriend after her old boyfriend cheated on her was a little too real for me not to be like, oh girl, I feel your pain. I completely understand. That is annoying as shit. I get you, girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? I liked how the reason why she decided to jump in and figure out what was going on. You know, um, Mr. Fung is dead and Peter is the suspect number one that the police believe he's the, he's the guy. She's known Peter forever. She's like, no, he can't. He can't possibly do it. So she kind of unintentionally starts gathering clues, but also, you know, you get the feel that this is a really kind of closed off community. Um, you know, an outside policeman's probably not going to get very far talking to, uh, you know, the people in this Asian village. That's what the, uh, the name of the shopping center is. You know, it's not, it's not going to work, you know? Um, Again, this isn't a romance, it's a mystery. Um, a lot of these cozy kind of mysteries have a romantic like subplot, and I get it. The cop, like I get why she thought he was hot. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I think he's hot too. Damn girl, you and me, we got the same issues. Um, <laughs> and also like, I get that he was a jerk in one scene and that propelled her to start investigating for herself. So she's like, he's an asshole. He's not going to figure this out. He's just going to blame this on Peter. I got to do it. I also, from his point of view, she is on the suspect list and she's like cozying up to him in a bar. If I was in his, you know, shoes, I would be like, what are you after too? You know what I mean? But also I'm a paranoid uh, bitch. So there you go. <laughs> I, I liked it, you know? Um, but again, what I like, you might not like. And what you like, I might not like. That's fine. But I thought this was a hoot. I enjoyed myself quite a bit. I'm kind of, I'm like, oh, I want to read the second one right now. But, you know, um, yeah, I had a blast. I liked Lana a lot. And I liked the kind of subtle sense of humor she had about herself in the writing. Um, there was just sort of a Like, it's hard to explain. You know when you see, like, a Disney movie? This is not going to be a good comparison. But when you see a D Disney movie and then, like, remember there was a time with Disney movies when, like, the main character, like, the thing opened up, the movie opened up and the main character was, like, getting pushed into a locker and then it freezes and it's like, well, I wonder, I think you wonder how I got here, huh? Well, let me tell you. It kind of had that feel to it, you know? And if we were all on her point of view, first person point of view. There was no jumping to random people, which I really appreciate because I find with mysteries that it's just, it's like a cheap device to make things more complicated than they have to be. You know what I mean? And to make the reader be more confused about who the killer is. If your murder plot line is strong enough, you don't need those cheap little tricks. You know what I mean? So... I had fun. I enjoyed myself. I'm going to read more of it. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. I know I barely said anything about this book and I ran to like 20 minutes about the other one. Because this is a mystery. And there's a lot of twists and turns. Like there's a twist and turn with a strip club. There's a twist and turn with um, a art gallery. A, lo a secret love nest. This random bar called Zodiac that had drinks that I really want to try. Like, Aries Flamethrower, I think that's what it was called. I'm like, I am so curious. <laughs> um, you know, I could picture the uh, the shopping center of the Asian village because where I grew up in uh, New Jersey, they were something um, very much like that. You know, there was a manga store and uh, a supermarket. And, and, like, I could just picture that in my head when I was reading it. So maybe that's why I enjoyed it. I just could see it in my head really well because I'm familiar with um a setting like that maybe that's why I don't know um 
Lana had a very sarcastic kind of tone to her, which you know I love. We love a sarcastic bitch. So I enjoyed myself. And there was like a little pug. She had a little pug every once in a while. So there we go. And yes, this is the, um, I swear I won't tell anybody, Mealy tells her best friend. Because she's like, to one of the people on her list, she's like, I swear I won't tell anybody. No one will ever know. And immediately gets in her car and calls her best friend and tells her exactly what happened. I was like, Puh. <laughs> like, that's just, that was good. Okay. Well, I don't want too much time for me to get back to the real world. Like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you later. Bye.